Hey, it's time for TV Skywriter. Greetings, everybody. Welcome to TV Skywriter. I'm Patricia A. Murray, your host. I usually do the Durham Skywriter, but right now I'm doing TV Skywriter, where I'm telling you about people you need to know. In fact, let's not tell, let's show. Let us welcome Danielle Boos, author of Life and Lyrics. Welcome to the show, Danielle. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be on your show. Hi, this is super fun. I love Blab and I love doing TV Skywriter. Now we met at Blab, which is really awesome. You meet the real, in fact, Sir Charles Carey, who's also in the audience, he was on last week with his book which he's, he told us the name. Okay, wait, I don't want to get it wrong, so let me scroll up. Sir Charles's book is called Radiate the Brain and Change the Game. But today, with Danielle Boos, we're talking about life and lyrics. So before, I, first I want to start off by telling you I loved your book. Yay! I, I loved it, and it's captivating. It's, it's, um, it's written very... It's almost as if you had a coach, someone telling you to make sure it's conversational so that the flow is just right, because that's exactly how I took it. Actually, no, that's just how I talk. And um, I wrote it in the way that I talk. Awesome. Well, and I'm really always cool. nervous about it because I, I'm writing more because I don't feel um, for a long time. I would I said and it was really a negative belief, bad self-talk. Mm -hmm. And I would say I'm not a good writer and I don't feel I can write well. Um, because I say, I'm, I'm a, I like to talk. I prefer to have a conversation than write it down. And mm -hmm. whenever I write it down, I'm like, this is just me talking. It's not professional enough. And so I, when I first started creating the book, I was writing it in a very professional way. Mm -hmm. It didn't come off the same way. So I said, I'm mm -hmm. going to go back and tell the story in my way, in my voice. And hopefully I think that's the best way. It'll be well received. And so far it's, it's been, been well received. So. Yeah, I really like it. Now, um, talking about writing style, when I first started my my first newspaper in Chicago, the South Side Scoop, well, actually it was the Woodlawn Scoop when I first started. It was in the low income area of Woodlawn, my neighborhood. And my natural writing style is actually formal. Mm -hmm. And it took a while for me to relearn how to write and how to make it conversational. It comes natural now, but it it sometimes it takes work. It takes real work to make yourself more, to me, when you're more conversational, it's more like first person. Mm -hmm. um, people get to know you better because they can hear your voice. They can hear you as if you were talking. And that's how it was with your book. Yeah, I accomplished but, it. That was perfect. I think now, when I was thinking of the different stories, I wanted to be very vivid in my description. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I could take people back to the different places. So you could kind of be sitting and going through it with me. Mm -hmm. That was the objective. When I was first, first, tell us the premise of the book, and then I want to go backwards. But tell us the life and lyrics. What is that all about? Well, honestly, I have a nonprofit called Achievable Greatness, and I wanted to figure out a way to tell my story in a creative way, but bring awareness to what we do in the community for visibility. Um, so 2016 is the year of visibility for me. That's my goal um, mm -hmm. for myself and my nonprofit. So when I was creating the book, I wanted the book to be a reflection of my experiences, but also to be a story that a young person could pick up, read, and see that no matter what you go through in life, you can overcome it. Um, mm -hmm. So I definitely wanted to be a message that um, is geared to the population that we work with. And we spend a lot of time with high school kids, college age kids, um, at-risk youth. Mm -hmm. So if you are a person who is an at-risk youth, you pick up this book, you see my journey, and you see how I overcame different things so that you can do the same thing. So that was the premise. When I thought about um, telling my story, I wanted to do it in a creative way because I'm really, I like to do creative things. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want it to just be a page turner where it's like this autobiography of the journey. I didn't want to do that. Um, so I thought about the different things that I love and I love music. Music's one of those things that I really enjoy. Um, and I thought about how I had a soundtrack to my life. There were different songs that fit with different experiences along with the journey, good, bad, and in between. And as I kept thinking about the concept, I was like, I've never really seen a book written this way. Uh, and I'm not sure if I can really do it legally. <laughs> um, cause at first I wanted to be able to put 
the different um because like for each song there's a part of the song so maybe it's the chorus of the song well let, let's go back and explain that each chapter mm -hmm. is a song title yep right okay so that's what she's talking about folks okay. but you but you actually wanted to have a song in there yes and so when i originally started developing the book i put the different choruses of the songs in the book mm -hmm. um and then i did some research and i noticed that you cannot do that legally um mm -hmm. and even if you quote the person um saying like that this is the lyric from this song you still have to get permission from the person who developed the song oh. or you can be sued um, so when I first learned that, I was like, okay, this isn't going to happen. I can't write my book. And I just put it on hold because um, I was doing it over the summer of um, last year mm -hmm. and I just stopped. So I had maybe three short stories and I just didn't do any more with it because I was like, I can't do it. And if I can't do it like I want to do it, I don't want to do it at all because I'm stubborn like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I put it off. Um, and then a little bit before my birthday, I was talking to a, a business friend of mine, Alicia Brown. Um, and she was like, well, why don't you just take the verses out and just use the titles? Can't you do that? And I was like, that's a good idea. So I did some little Google searching and I was like, I can really use the titles and their names. Like I won't be sued. So then I came back and I told her, I was like, I'm going to do it before my birthday. And that was like, I gave myself three weeks to write the rest of the book. Three actually, weeks? Actually two, because she needed a week to edit it. Um, wow. And and I just did it. I, I think I was actually on a Dr. Vibe show or somewhere and I just said it. I was like, I'm going to have it by my birthday. And I just stuck. I remember you saying that. I, mm -hmm. I stuck to it. I was like, well, I put it out in the universe, so I just got to do it. Um, mm -hmm. And so I spent a weekend and I flushed out like 90% of the book from a Friday to a Sunday with very wow. little sleep. And wow. I got it edited and the rest is history. Wow. That's amazing. And it's called Life and Lyrics. Yes. Now let's go back. Okay. Because most people, when you read their books and they're talking about themselves, they, very often they make themselves, you know, heroic and mm -hmm. talk about their, how they have valiantly, you know, overcome this and that. But you were brutally honest, and you were telling us that you have failed in your life. You've had some failures, mm -hmm. and some serious challenges. So that made me curious because you didn't exactly spell it out. But where did you grow up, and how did you grow up? I grew up in a city called Lynchburg, Virginia, and I grew up when I was first born. I have a twin sister, so it was me and her, and wow. I had a mom and dad, and uh, we lived. I wouldn't say we. We were poor, but we were low, low income family mm -hmm. together. Um, we went uh, about five years after I was born. My brother was born. Um, so mm -hmm. there was three of us. Uh, my parents were teenagers when they gave birth to me and my sister. So they were this young mm -hmm. couple, teenagers doing teenage things. And uh, they became um, pregnant with us and they got married and they wanted to do Sweet. it the right way. Um, however, my dad had struggles he uh, had struggles with substance abuse and that was a challenge for their relationship plus being young parents and dealing with that and both trying to work um so it didn't work out and it wasn't where i had a where i saw my mom and dad like arguing all the time because that wasn't the case but it was like they were happy you could tell and then all of a sudden they weren't really talking mm -hmm. to each other or whatever so you mm -hmm. kind of knew something and i was young um so they <clears throat> got a divorce when I was probably about mm. eight years old. And I noticed at that time that he was absent way more. Um, and some of his substance abuse led to him going to jail. Um, so he was sporadically in and out of jail. And I am a dad's girl, like I'm mm. daddy's girl. Like that is mm. my guy. And he, he's always been that to me, even his flaws. I still like, I don't care. Even when they got divorced, so, you were still able to see him? Periodically, when in, even though he was in and out of jail, whenever he was out, I would okay. be able to see him. Um, but I didn't see mm -hmm. him as much. So that was like my first like lingering of loss of protection because like I now, now don't feel protected. Um, I, I don't have that male there mm -hmm. anymore. Um, and I cling to my mom and we got, um, we were close in my very early mm -hmm. years. 
And part of the closeness caused a little bit of confusion for us um, because she would come and talk to me about like some adult stuff. So like if her friends were mm-hmm. acting up um, or if she was having trouble at work. So I thought like I was the little grown kid, you know, cause mom comes and she doesn't talk to my sister and my brother. She just talks mm-hmm. to me. Um, and she would always say I'm very mature. Um, so in my head, you can tell me I wasn't an adult. So when, you know, them teenage years come, or when she's like, clean your room and like motherly, I'm like, hold up, but we friends. Oh, that's like, funny. What are you, uh, what are you doing? Funny. So, so we, we had those, those conflicts. Um, but I, I could talk to her for the most part about certain things. I always wanted to guide, um, keep her from being mm-hmm. hurt. So if it was like something that I knew that I would say that could hurt her, I tried not to say it. Um, and, and have those conversations. Like I knew, um, talking to her about failed relationships would be a tough mm-hmm. topic, you know, so I wouldn't bring now, that Sometimes up. the kid um, can't wait to get old enough to say the wrong thing to their parents. So why were you so protective? Um, I think because I felt bad for what happened for her. And I felt bad for the the situation that she was placed in because even as a young person, I saw struggle and I saw her struggle and I knew that she, this wasn't the life she wanted for us and this wasn't the life that she wanted for herself and that I, I saw her getting up when she was sick, mm-hmm. like super sick and going to work and I saw her missing mm-hmm. sleep to make sure um, that we had. So I didn't want to be an extra mm-hmm. hindrance. This sensitive kid. Um, That's and- nice. Mm-hmm. So, so I didn't want to do it. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell her a lot of things. I kept a lot of stuff mm-hmm. to myself. And as a kid, did you notice any great um, change in your standard of living after your, after your parents got divorced? Oh yeah. Um, we were living in college Hill at, at the time when they were together and shortly after they divorced and this was low income apartments. Um, before we were in the low income apartments, there were some other sporadic stays at houses because my dad would get really good jobs, like mm-hmm. city jobs, and like he would get high positions, but then he would mm. screw it up. So we go from living like really good and then not mm. so good. Um, and so when we before they divorced, we were at College Hill Apartments, and I loved it there. I you couldn't really tell me it was like low income because um, we had a nice apartment. It was like newly mm. remodeled. And there were other kids to play with outside all the time. Um, our house was actually right beside the police precinct. Oh, okay. So we didn't really have to deal with mm-hmm. violence so much. Um, but, you know, it, it was definitely low-income housing. I love it. Low, was it a low-rise? So, okay. Mm-hmm. So um, then my mom decided that, you know, she didn't want us to be raised like that anymore. And she wanted us to have a house okay. of our own. And so she worked really hard. Um, and, and, you know, your rent there is based on right. your income. So when she started generating more jobs, her rent there became outrageous. Oh. So like you're paying all crazy rent to live in what other people might be paying $50 mm-hmm. a month. Yeah, you might have to pay eight based on the income. So she was trying to get to a place where she could mm-hmm. buy a home. And so she Save, 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 and she bought this home. And this home was mm-hmm. old. Okay, it was hers, but it was old. And when we went, you know, from a, a young kid's perspective, you go from living in an apartment where I shared a room with my sister, but we mm-hmm. had a nice room. Like we had our own space in there. Um, there was two bathrooms, and and we had friends around. It was yeah. a cool place to me. It was heaven. And then you move me to this old house where it's like super cold oh, in the winter. Yeah super hot in the mm-hmm. summer. Like I hated that house and it didn't look like change to me. It didn't look like we were doing better to me. It felt like we were doing wow. worse because we just moved to a neighborhood that's not so safe now. Um, there is sporadic violence. The neighbors that live behind me clearly are selling drugs because mm-hmm. it's obvious. And um, the house is it's not as nice. And this is now where we have to call home and I don't have any friends. Oh, you moved far away. um, It wasn't like super far. It was across Mm -hmm. town, but there was no way I could get back over there. I mean, but you had had to go to a different school then, right? Different school. 
Yeah, so all these different changes um, were definitely challenging. Our relationship really changed a lot at this point. Um, there was resentment there uh, because I was like, you just took me from everything I love and you brought me here. And and it was tough, but I tried to um, take make the best of it. So there's a story in the book um, where I talk about how I hated moving here and, and I said, but my mom would allow me to go see a friend who was a new friend and I could go to her house so I could get on my bike and ride my bike down the hill to her house. And when I get to her house, um, she's really cool and chill and she lives in a household with both of her parents, which I hadn't really seen um, growing up. So it was cool to see the dynamics of her parents. And even though she had friends, she like invited me into her mm -hmm. circle. Um, so because she did that, I felt like, okay, well, at least I have one person. And me and my sister um, were not as close by this time because she was like a bookworm and was staying in books and studying and in her room. All so the time. it's not, it's not so true. It the like, twins always share their own language and are finishing each other's mm -hmm. sentences and eerily close. We have our moments. But we are really night and day different. We're like very different. Um, I feel her pain though. Like for instance, she fell down the steps as a young girl and broke her oh. collarbone. And I hurt, like my collarbone hurt for her, like as if mine was hurting. Um, and when it happened, I was not at home and I just wow. felt severe pain. So I didn't see it happen to her, but I just, and then I, I learned later. Oh. So we, we had that when um, I was having issues with my heart, she mm -hmm. knew. Um, so we have that kind of connection, but we're very huh. different. Um, we speak differently. We act differently. I'm very playful. Mm -hmm. um, I live in a gray area and she's really black and white. Huh. Yeah. And we, we, we know that about each other. So it works mm -hmm. now. But at the time, it was like, I'm in this new place. I have no friends. And my daughter, I mean, my sister just wants to sit here and read and study. And are you kidding me? This is so boring. <laughs> But, so so that was but, but the dynamic was, though of your mom going from renter to homeowner did that mean anything to you or because you didn't like the house not at the time. I didn't care I was like I would rather us be renting with my friends in a house that stays warm like where we have good air condition and we have good mm -hmm. heating and it doesn't leak when it rains yeah. really bad so like I didn't put that story in the book but um the house was so old that if we had really mm -hmm. bad rain, it would flood in the oh. basement. And down in the basement um, is where we kept the mm -hmm. heater. I think it's the big old heater okay. system. And you couldn't let it get, like, it could if it flooded, it mm -hmm. would mess up. So we would have to go down there with buckets. Wow. buckets. Well, I, re I remember I having to run down every time it rained and putting the standpipe in to make sure that the basement didn't flood. So I don't know if mm -hmm. you guys... So, so you have oh, some oh, yeah. stories, we, we, we didn't have that kind of like system. Mm -hmm. So it would just bucket it out and, you know, and I hated it. It was just, and later in life, it made sense why she wanted mm -hmm. to do that. But as a kid, in my, my mind, it was just like mm -hmm. a bad decision. We could have just stayed where we were. Um, but, but it was a necessary thing for her, I think. And it taught me something later in life. Um, about sacrifice and part of that experience my childhood like moving from College Hill to moving to the house was I, I didn't want my kids to have that mm -hmm. experience so I, when I became a mother it became like I had to matter of fact there was no other option but to give them a better life and, want, and not that I had a bad mm -hmm. life but I just wanted them to have more than me I never wanted my daughter to be in her room and feel like she can't um, be cool in, in the summer and warm mm -hmm. in the winter. You know, I didn't want her to ever have to feel that way. So I was like, I'm going to do everything humanly possible to make sure they don't have that experience. Well, with, when you became um, a mom, um, was it difficult for you? Because in reading the book, it sounds like it was somewhat of a challenge. <laughs> somewhat is, is the understatement um, to but she came at a point where, where I needed her because um, if you notice in the book, I was sexually assaulted um, when, I, when I was a teenager. And during that time, I uh, was, I didn't want to kill myself, but I didn't care about living. Like I could have laid in the bed and never got out of the bed and that probably would have worked wow. for me. 
I was spiraling out of control. Something. I was drinking. I was partying. I was hanging out with people that I really didn't know, like getting in cars with them, driving to North Carolina and going clubbing. Oh, goodness. Like two hours away. Like I was really doing You were out there. Yeah, you were out that there. was me. I was just doing it all. And I really didn't care. And I had, um, I was always good in school. Like I'm one of those people who can sit in the classroom and hear the teacher talk and consume the information, but not really pay attention. Don't really read, don't really mm-hmm. focus, um, but I can retain the information. Mm-hmm. So I went from getting really good grades to really just not caring about grades and not caring about coming to school. I would skip classes. I would skip school. By this time, I I was able to get a little car to drive around. Um, So it was really easy to dip out on school. Wait a minute. So you had a part-time job, apparently? (laughs) No, my grandmother, uh, actually the one that lives Mm -hmm. with me now, she was like, you know, I'm going to get her a car to help her get around. And I think really... My grandma at that time and my mom and them were trying to make me happy mm-hmm. again because I went from being the social butterfly, positive, yeah, you know, the way you are now, um, to really being like night and day different and, and them just wanting this, well, what can we do, you know, to try to make it better for her? And so I think her giving me the car was one of those things, but I was still spiraling mm-hmm. at that time. Okay. Um, and so when I met uh, Ari, my, my daughter's father, um, he came at a time where I didn't feel safe. Mm -hmm. I lost my safety. I lost my security, my trust in other people. And when I met him, I felt like he would keep me safe because he was crazy. At the time, the crazy, his personality, Mm -hmm. I didn't know is defined as being bipolar. Okay. Um, I just thought he just had one of those personalities where he's just like, we got all these highs and lows, but maybe that's just him, but he wouldn't let anything Mm -hmm. happen to me. I felt very safe with him. Um, he sold drugs, and I, I knew this. I made a decision to still be in a relationship with him. I got pregnant mm-hmm. with my daughter. Um, at this time, when I got pregnant with her, that was my kind of light bulb, my light. So now I have something to live okay. for. And even though I'm a teenager, I don't even got much to offer her. And like I tell you in the book, like the very first mm-hmm. short stories, like I don't even have right. the foundation to be a mother right. to her. I, I I identified at 16 years old while pregnant that I was not prepared to be a, pre- a parent to her or be a mother to her. But I also knew at 16 that this was my hope because I didn't have any hope okay. anymore, that I didn't care about life anymore. Well, it's and good, so you, it's good that, that you weren't so hopeless that you considered abortion. Mm-mm, that wasn't even mm-hmm. an option. Um, so I was like, I'm going to do what I need to do to be a better mm-hmm. mother for her. And so in my head at 16, I got to get it right for her. So first I'm trying to fix her daddy, which was a nightmare. Ain't no fixing him because he don't want to be fixed. He's cool with what he's doing. He's cool with life. So I accepted uh, when she was born that she would be my responsibility and he might come along for the ride and he might not. And if he doesn't, I'm still going to make it happen. So I, I had my daughter um i told him i was i came and brought her infant mm. self to the jail cell where he was wow. locked up and with her he saw her through the screen and i said you continue to come back and forth here i will not make weekly trips up here for you mm-hmm. to see her so if you want to be a father then you're gonna have to choose so to did he straighten now and he oh. no he, he got out and maybe six months he got in trouble again and went back and was in there for a very mm-hmm. long time um, and most of her life, he's been incarcerated. He's currently incarcerated mm-hmm. right now. Um, and that has been his choice, his yeah. journey. So I accepted that early on that I was going to probably be a single mother. I was probably going to be doing mm-hmm. it by myself. So I did it by myself. But it was hard. It was hard mm-hmm. as heck. Um, my mom was supportive for the most part. And I knew why she was that way. So she was upset with me um, because I got pregnant. Right. Because she got pregnant. She was probably hoping home. that you wouldn't make the like, same decision yeah Yeah. it's clearly she was like you you see my horror story and then you just go sign up for the same story like why would you do that um so I knew she was upset with me for that reason so she said this is your baby which means when your baby's crying at two o'clock at night um which means you better figure out how you're gonna Mm. buy diapers and if it's so bad that you can't I might help you out from time to time but that's your baby and she made that very, very Okay, clear. now wait a minute. Um, if she's saying that, how is it that you're going to school and taking care of the baby? 
Well, while I was pregnant, I was homeschooled for a good part of that. And that was because I attended a school um, that predominantly mm-hmm. white school. And, and my principal clearly said, you know, you, you can't stay here while pregnant. Um, and so there's this school you can go to, um, but you won't be able to stay in your advanced classes anymore because mm-hmm. um, it's not an option mm-hmm. there. And um, you'll have to change your whole degree. And uh, I'm, I'm, I had okay grades, but I'm really smart. And so I was in all these advanced mm-hmm. classes. And I was like, so you're telling me I can't get my advanced degree because I'm pregnant. Um, and my mom... I told mom, I said, mom, it's not fair. So she helped me and she fought Mm. it. And I'm thankful for her because when she fought it, they, they made, um, substitutions for me, uh, accommodations. So they had someone come to the house with me with my homework, um, until I gave birth to my daughter. And then during that little maternity leave piece, I had someone still come to the house and help me with my schoolwork to get it done. And then when I finished with the the leave, I was able to transition back into school and graduate. Um, And my grandmother played a significant role at that time um, because she would come over and watch my daughter for me um, so I could do do my home studies and then she would keep her from me when I went back to school. And I'm sure she agreed to do that because you were serious about your work. You were serious about your work. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. And and I I really think that she she wanted to also ensure, let me know that I wasn't by Mm -hmm. myself because I was hearing that a lot. And I was also hearing that I was going to be a failure. And I, I was going, I was going to end up like on welfare, and I was going to end up not having a good life. So when you, when people who you are supposed to love you tell you those things, sometimes you start internalizing and believing it. And so she was a different voice, and she was saying something mm-hmm. different. She was like, "You're not alone, baby, and I got oh, you, and I'm gonna help you with oh, this baby, and we're gonna get through this together." And so that voice, um, and I'm gonna be crying, <laughs> um, but that voice helped me. Um, to push through when I wanted to give up when I was tired Um, and it it helped me finish school. And that same voice was there when I said to to my grandma, Hey grandma, I want to go to college. Mm -hmm. Um, I had graduated from high school in 2002 Mm -hmm. and for a year I doubted myself and and I do this a lot and I need to stop. I know I do. Um, But I doubted myself thinking that I wasn't college material well, you're super okay. smart even though i well, got you're super smart exactly but i was just like i'm not college material i can't do this so i went to a community college mm-hmm. for a year got really good grades at the community college and i was like oh okay i think and I can you saved a lot of money and you saved a lot of money. yeah yeah so yeah. i did that first year at the community college then i applied um to north carolina central yeah. university yeah. and i was like Yes, I saw a different world growing up, and that was going to be my experience. I was, if I'm paying thousands of dollars to go to college, I'm going to an HBCU. Go. I'm not going to any HBCU. I'm going to North Carolina Central University because that's where I'm supposed awesome. to be. Um, awesome. And so I, I enrolled, I got accepted, and I told my mom. And I was like, you're not going all the way to Durham for college. Like, you got a baby to take care of. And I was devastated because I was like, but Ma, I, I like really... No, you have a baby. You, you don't need to do that. Um, so she was she wasn't having it. She didn't think it was a good idea. She didn't. She wasn't going to help me get there. She wasn't going to help me financially do it. Um, but my grandma was my road dog, and she was like, "We're going to figure it out." Um, my my car that we had bought over high school by this time mm-hmm. had broke down, so I didn't have any more. My eight hundred dollar car was mm-hmm. gone, and and so I went uh, and I had a friend drive me to school. And my grandmother would send me money whenever she could. Um, and my, my grandparents and my mom stepped in and helped with my daughter the first year until I got on my feet. And once I was able to transition off campus into my own place, eventually she was able to come along. For wow. The ride. So you were a and, mom um, so you were slash a mom student. Yep. Slash student. Okay. I was. I was. Okay. And that, that time was one of the most challenging times mm-hmm. in my life. I developed... Um, panic attacks because I was stressed Mm -hmm. out all the time because I was maintaining a place for me and her to stay. So it was expensive. I was working at a daycare and they would allow her to stay at the daycare. So I would get up very early in the morning and help out and be like a bus Mm -hmm. attendant to make sure all the kids were getting on and off the bus and in the classroom. Then I would run to my classes and in between my classes, I would run, um, back there, work some more so I can get just yeah, enough yeah. work hours yeah, to yeah. pay my rent and my utilities. 
And then in the evenings, I would come home sometime and I would, my daughter would eat and I wouldn't eat much of anything because we didn't have a lot of money. And I wanted to make sure she ate a well-balanced meal and she never knew struggle because in my head, I was like, my kid can never see struggle. So, so we lived in a pretty decent place, but I paid a lot for us to stay there. And I went without so she could have. And at the time, I didn't know I qualified for things like uh, public assistance, like yeah. food stamps and things, because I yeah. figured I was in college and I had student loans that they wouldn't. And at the, when I got older, I realized, you know, I probably could have got some food stamps sure. or something to help feed us. Sure. Um, but I didn't know that. And, and I didn't know about any resources at the school to kind of give me that advice. So I toughed through it for, for many years. And um, it was definitely really, really hard. But I had professors pop in who saw me struggling and they became more than professors. They became nice. like family. And nice. Um, like one of my professors, Miss Austin, um, who passed away recently, um, she she saw me outside one day. I was crying. I was bawling, crying. And I was like, I just can't do this anymore. And she was like, oh, no, you can't give up. And she started sending me care packages. And she would watch my daughter for me so I could finish some of my night classes. And she talked to the other professors. And she said, look, this girl doesn't need you to make accommodations for her. But I just want y'all to know. Like, this is her story, and she's silently doing mm. these things. And so people would just send me care packages and send me money and oh, nice. different things to help me out. Nice. It was just, like, really cool. Um, and I graduated, and, and I got my degree, and I love Central. I you know, know I, I love Central. Like, anything HBCU, I'm there if I can make it happen. But tell me about your graduation, um, though. Who showed up at your graduation? Um, my graduation was very fun. So I cooked a huge meal for all my family the day before graduation. I was up wee hours a night um, frying chicken, fixing green beans, I mean, not green, mm -hmm. greens, mm -hmm. collard greens, and macaroni and cheese. And I fed like 30 of my family oh. because I had so many family come to my apartment to celebrate with me. And I loved it. So my mom was there for sure. My sister, my brother was there. My grandparents were there. I had aunts and uncles yeah. there. Um, I had cousins, like I had friends. So it was like a huge party celebration. They couldn't all go um, to the specific right. ceremony. They were at my house and we like had like this party at my house. And then, and it was so cool because I lived in an apartment complex where the neighbors mm -hmm. even came and celebrated and we had cake and it was uh such a time I was still serving yeah. like I was serving my family but I was happy mm -hmm. to serve them and it was it was perfect and that was like my gift back to them to say you know what this meal I prepared it in love for you because I wouldn't have graduated right. had it not been for them and there's you. and there's and no had, way that you foresaw that in those days when you were just lying in bed just not even caring if you lived or not there's no way that there's no, no way that you saw that coming no, none whatsoever. So um, it was definitely one of those moments that will live in history mm -hmm. for me, um, big accomplishment for me. Uh, during my central times, I learned a lot about myself. I became an advocate for sexual okay. assault abuse um, to help heal my story. So I would go to the local high schools and the community centers and I would go talk to the kids about sexual mm -hmm. assault and sexual abuse and signs and things to keep yourself safe. And if you have been assaulted, some stuff that you can do um, to cope, some healthy mm -hmm. coping skills. And that gave me the opportunity to share my story and mm -hmm. heal more um, because I kept it bottled in in my high school days for not wanting to upset my mother because the person who assaulted me was someone she used to date. Mm. And, and I knew like it was just a traumatic experience yeah. for her and me. Um, so I never really put a lot of voice to what happened. But when I got to college, I was like, these people don't mm -hmm. know me. So I shared my story and I was able to get myself a little bit free from it and um, advocate. And, and my voice came nice. at that time. So um, I'm advocating sexual assault. And then I'm advocating social justice uh -oh. issues like the gender six right, situation. Right. Yeah, um, I actually helped raise money for that. And I, I, I just found a part of Danielle that I didn't know existed while in college. And I've been holding mm -hmm. on to her for a very long time. I guess time. that's the one we so, know, right? Yeah, that's the one you know and you see all the time. So I'm I'm glad to have found her and I, I try to stay in, in tune mm -hmm. with me and making sure that I'm being my most authentic self and, and not allowing situations to make me 
So different. you said in your book that during hard times you would turn to music. So in those mm -hmm. days, what were you doing? Zoning out with headphones or uh, or how, how were you so enjoying music I'm, in those days? When I was at home, I wouldn't have to necessarily have headphones. Mm -hmm. And when I was on college campus, sometimes I would maybe have one mm -hmm. in my ear. But typically I'm paying attention because um, Central is, is great. But it was sometimes safety when you're walking in certain mm -hmm. streets, going back and forth to your car. You don't want to yeah, be right. <laughs> focused yeah, on music. Right. You want to pay attention to your surroundings. So I wouldn't. But when I was at home and I had like times where like maybe my daughter was sleeping, I could really like listen mm -hmm. to music um, and, and drink. Usually I was drinking a little bit too much mm -hmm. then. Um, but I would have like wine or alcohol or something and listen to music and try to de de-stress de myself mm -hmm. that way. Um, and, and that's what I did. And music was kind of the thing that I went to was my go-to thing. It yeah. helped a lot. So were you, so had you realized you, that you were a good writer you, then? Or? No, or, I, I didn't realize I was a good writer to probably this year. Wow. Yeah, I, I can write um, the things that I knew I did well in writing. I knew that I could write um, poetry because that was one of the things I did when I, um, after I was sexually assaulted, I would write poetry and that would help me. Um, so that was one thing I knew I could do. And I could do like clinical notes because I was in the mental health field and all my notes have to be clinical. So I know I know how to write that way, but to express myself in the way I did in my book, I really didn't think I I'm could do How does poetry help? I mean, when you write poetry after um, you've been hurt, do you write angry poems or do you write poems to soothe yourself? Well, when I first, it, it was kind of like a cycle of grief. So in the beginning, it was kind of angry. And then it was kind of um, denial. And then it was kind of, but this happened to me and acceptance of what happened to me. And then on the other end, I'm a survivor mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And when I started getting to the survival part, I didn't feel the need to write okay. so much. And we have a question here. Um, who are your favorite poets and musicians? All right, so um, Maya Angelou, mm -hmm. um, Zora Neale mm -hmm. Hurston, uh, musicians, I would have to say Tupac is my okay. favorite. Um, I have a little bit of a crush on him. And <laughs> uh, who else for, for musicians? Jill Scott. Okay. I love Jill Scott. I actually didn't put her in the book, um, but I had a story for her, but I didn't want my stories to collide together. Mm -hmm. But, you know, her, Queen Latifah, okay. and... Um, like Marvin Sapp, okay. like um, who else? Uh, Etta James, oh. like I could go on, on and on and on. I like all different types of mm -hmm. music, uh, Carrie mm -hmm. Underwood. Um, so like it's different genres, different types of styles that I like. Um, typically I spend a lot of time listening to soulful mm -hmm. music. Um, and I noticed that that's kind of my, my thing. Okay. So I want to know what it took to write this book. I mean, you probably thought about it for a fleeting second. And when did you mm -hmm. commit to writing this book? And how did you figure out how to how to get started? It's, it's really hard getting started for some people. Well, I it, it took two commitments. So the first time when I had the brilliant idea to add the mm -hmm. verses, uh, and I started it then, I was excited. But then when I saw that I couldn't do that legally, it made me like give up. Right. for a while. Um, and then after learning that I could potentially just put the title of the song and the artist, I made the commitment on the Dr. Vibe show by saying I'm going to have it by my mm -hmm. birthday. And, and I was like, okay, I said it publicly. So I, I don't like to make an ass mm -hmm. of myself. So if I tell somebody I'm going to do something, I do it. <laughs> well, why don't you hold up that book? I don't have it because I have the electronic version. The book we're talking about life mm -hmm. and lyrics. It's available on Amazon. It's also um, available on Barnes and Noble for the Nook. And I think you can also buy it on Barnes and Noble, the hard copy at this okay. point. Um, yeah. So that's, that's the book Life and Lyrics. And so when I make that commitment, I decided to go back and flush the stories that I ori originally wrote to make sure that they, they worked mm -hmm. well. Um, I thought it, it was strategy, really, because I was like, I want to make sure that I tell parts of my story to get people clear that I overcame certain things, but I also want to show them positive parts of mm -hmm. my life. Um, because if you look at a person's story, you don't want to just focus on the right. negative. You want to really pay attention to the whole journey. And along the way, there were really some really cool parts of my life that I wanted mm -hmm. to depict. 
and the story. So when I was thinking about the story, like this could have been like 150 or longer mm -hmm. pages because it was like so much, but I wanted to condense it. Um, so I picked out the parts that really mattered the most mm -hmm. to share. And, and then I, I went and, and I suckered through it. It was a lot of crying. Oh, wow. It was kind of like, do oh, I really wow. want to share this part of me to the universe? Am I ready? Um, is this part of my journey that I think I'm ready to to give where I won't hurt my family? Oh, right. Um, it wasn't oh, right. always about me. It was really about, I don't want anybody to read the story and think that there are any villains because there are no villains in my life. Like even the person who sexually assaulted me had his own issues mm -hmm. and his own mm -hmm. problems. So I don't look at life where I'm the victim and there were these villains who did all these horrible things for me. I look at my life that people did the very best they could with what they got and they loved me no matter mm -hmm. what. And they showed me love. And because they showed me love, I'm able to love other wow. people. Um, wow. And so that was what was important to me when I shared my story and I um, talk about like my dad and his drugs abuse. Um, and when there's a story in there called daddy, mm -hmm. And I, I really talk about him in a way that's important because a lot of people are like, oh, you had a dad with drug problems. So Lord, and you think that like my whole life was this traumatic experience with him, but no, like, yeah, he struggled in that area. But my dad was like the coolest guy. Like he would get us in his mm -hmm. truck and he would ride us up in the mud and we'd go play in the mud and get dirty. Um, we would go fishing. Um, we would go on these long walks and talk. And he had his advice is like out of this mm. world. So he's not going to tell me the storybook pretty answer right, right, to anything. Right, like right. he's going to give me the rough, this is what it is. This is life kind of answer. And he didn't sugarcoat mm. it for me. And I appreciate that about him. And also I learned parts of me through watching him. I was like, I am really his child. Like I carry his mm. DNA. There are things that he do mannerisms um, characteristics that I directly get from my father and I'm glad and I'm proud to be his his little girl and despite his flaws I am honored to say I'm daddy's girl so um, that was kind of like the message I wanted the world to see like you might see a flawed person but that's my daddy he's a superhero mm -hmm. to me um, no matter what so so I wanted to really humanize him and as well as my mother and and show that um, I love her and, and she's a rock star uh, but she she had struggles too, and and we all do, and and humanize myself. I didn't want me to come off as the pretty person who get it, who got it mm -hmm. all right, because that wasn't right. true. Like right. I got stuff wrong. I got stuff wrong a lot, and I still get stuff wrong. But along the way, I'm learning and growing, and and people can do that. They can learn, and they and can you grow. made the sacrifices and that you made needed to make, and they worked out. And now I was. I was reading where you said that you had to leave your child behind for a little bit while you went to school. And my dad was left behind by his mom. Um, my, my grandmother and great grandmother from Talladega, Alabama, and both of them left. They never really discussed Alabama. I, it must not have been a happy time for them. But in the 1920s, they left together and uh, lived in Indiana and had to leave my dad behind for like four or five years until they can get themselves together in Chicago. And they finally got him back and raised him and everything. And even I could tell there were, my dad had problems. He had some problems probably due, due to being separated from his loved ones at such a young age. But um, yeah. and long story short, my dad loved his mom and, and grandmother very much. And so I guess it was worth it. I, I, I'll bet that he probably wished that he hadn't gone through certain hardships, but it made him a great dad, I'll tell you that. So yeah. sometimes we just go through these things and they just add to our character. If we survive them and if we yeah. take them the right and way. And I tell you, um, my daughter in the last two years has really showed me how that time apart affected her emotionally. And you know, she felt like I abandoned mm -hmm. her. And just going through the steps of trying to get her well, we've been doing a lot of counseling mm -hmm. and therapy and stuff, and, and she's talked about it. And it's really hurtful um, to think that what I was doing to help her also harmed her, you know, um, because it, she definitely had that mom left mm -hmm. me, you know, and she still kind of struggles with that. And then um, at a time where she, she was so mm -hmm. young when I left, um, 
she was maybe four or five, you know, I think about five when I left. So she was really little. Um, she got left and I, I, and even though it wasn't a very long time, it was a, a little over mm-hmm. a year. Um, she was able to come back and stay with me for a long while. And then she had to leave again for about almost eight months mm-hmm. when I was making a transition mm-hmm. um, to, to get stable here in, in Virginia, in the Virginia Beach, Hampton mm-hmm. Roads area. So it was like two times of you got to go there till I get better. And um, she, she, she tells that, tells me that now, like, I wish you just would have took mm-hmm. me with you. And, you know, I would have rather sheltered, I mean, went through the different challenges, but, and, but she's coming from a young right. person's perspective and I um, honor what she has to say, but as her mother, I would not feel comfortable having to put her in some of the situations that yeah. I was in. Um, so, I had to do it. It was just sometimes you, know, you just have to do it. it. I mean, yeah, and that, I mean it was some some selfish sacrifice mm-hmm. to a degree because honestly, reality is like she said. Well, mom, you could have went to a school in Lynchburg, is what she said. Like you could have went to Lynchburg College and been with family, and she's right. I could have, but I really needed that experience. I really felt like I needed to go there and do that, and uh, I'm hoping that she will um, accept that that was the decision I made and it was made Mm -hmm. out of love and that I wasn't doing it to hurt her, but I was doing it to make things better. And and so we talk about it, but I know that it affects her now because I actually have heard her express Mm -hmm. it to me. My my son luckily was so little that it really didn't bother Mm -hmm. him so much that I was gone and he only missed me the the second Mm -hmm. time. Um, So um, it didn't really bother her, but I can tell it definitely played an effect on my daughter. So, um, I definitely don't want to do any more like extended stays away. Um, but, but I, I'm glad I did it then. And I'm glad I got the degree and I'm glad I got the experience. And, and, and so, maybe if she chooses to read your book, uh, she has, she's ready. Oh, and I think that's okay, helped a lot. Okay. Um, because, and so, when I, when I was sharing the story with her, I said, all right, when you get this book, I want you to know there's some things in here that you don't know about me, okay? Um, she knows I've been sexually okay. assaulted, but there are some other things about my life that she didn't really know. And I said, so when you read it, um, you're going to get some more information about your mother, um, but I want you to know that I'm human and, and you're making mistakes. Guess what? I made mistakes yeah. too. Um, but I didn't really put a lot of energy into sharing with her um, the reckless mm-hmm. behavior part of me because I don't want her to say, well, if mom did it, I can do it too. No, you, know? you may not. <laughs> yeah. So that can't be right. her cop exactly. out. So, uh, I didn't really like let her know, but I let her mm-hmm. read the book, especially now as she's going through different things. So she can see that you can overcome mm-hmm. stuff and be on the other side of it. So, um, that has helped us. I think we are definitely, um, building a stronger nice. bond. Um, and, and we're learning each other differently now. Um, so I'm hoping that in, in the few, few years, you know, the story will be perfect. She'll be good. I'll be good. Thank Life you. will be great. And I know it's going to happen. So yeah. how are you promoting, promoting the book and how are people um, responding to it? Um, the book is great. When I first uh, went live, it was supposed to be going on my birthday. Uh, unfortunately, Amazon listed it like a week before my birthday instead of the, t- the scheduled time, which was cool. So I got a bunch of pre-sale okay. orders. When I went live, um, the day after my birthday, I became a best-selling author. I sold mm-hmm. enough books to get bestseller author awesome. status. So that's been bomb. Exactly. <laughs> I've been enjoying that. Um, and I did a bunch of different marketing strategies. To, to sell my book. So some of the marketing strategies I used um, was social media promotion mm-hmm. for sure. Um, I read some, ran some ads on okay. Facebook uh, to help promote the book. And I used a video instead of like text in the image. People click on videos and watch like little 90 second videos, no problems. And so I did a little nice. 90 second That's video. Smart. Of the That's really smart. I pulled people in and I got sales mm-hmm. that way. And I did freebie giveaways. Uh, I did book signings, different book events to give it away. I did a lot of podcast interviews um, weeks. So it was about a week or two after, because during that time, that's when my daughter, my daughter ran mm-hmm. away from home and um, she was struggling. 
and she was placed in a residential treatment mm -hmm. facility. So I stopped some of my interviews to kind of work on self-care and manage her. And then after that, I came back when I was comfortable and I started doing interviews, podcasts, mm -hmm. sharing my book, sharing my story. And that has helped generate sales too. Um, so a bunch of different little things I've, I've done to help promote the book, sell the book. And in the process of promoting and selling the book, promoting my nonprofit, because that was the, the whole mm -hmm. premise of, of the book. And the first part of the book, I spend time really talking about achievable greatness and um, pulling people okay. in. Because I, I was wondering yeah. if you're able to put the book together with your work Mm -hmm. with um, young people? Mm -hmm. Are they able to discuss and learn about what you've been through in order to help them? Because your book is very relatable. Yes. And and in my nonprofit, actually, when we work with teenagers recently, we have been um, using the book okay. to help. And I'm actually partnering with Lutheran Family Services here. Um, and they actually work with foster mm -hmm. kids. And we will be using the book and we will also be doing some trainings and workshops to help them um, typically deal with some of the issues that are addressed mm -hmm. in the book and, and things that they're going through. So we're definitely incorporating the two. Um, I've reached out to some churches um, who have like high school kids that are mm -hmm. at risk. And we've been able to uh, partner with them and send some. I've donated books to some community centers here locally and yeah. some. Um, back in Lynchburg, Virginia, because I really wanted the kids back home where mm -hmm. I'm from to see that this, this chick from Lynchburg is doing it and you can too. So I went and donated a bunch of books to the community centers back home. And that's, that's been cool. Uh, another way of promoting that I didn't mention is I reached out to all the artists mm -hmm. in my book, every single artist in the book, I've reached out to them, sent them a personal mm -hmm. letter um, personalized to them along with a copy of the book. I've heard back from three. Really? Um, I was able to meet one of the artists, D1, um, the rapper for Sally Maybach, okay. where I talk about his own issues. I got to meet him recently um, where he autographed a copy of the book for me. He took a picture mm -hmm. with me. He shouted out the book All for right. me. Um, and so he, he was definitely impressed and he helped with marketing, he helped improve my numbers because I got new nice. followers, new engagement. Um, so, so that has also been helpful in promoting. And he's also planning to work with me in the near future to come back and do something um, with my nonprofit. So, all good. I stuff. love it. But now, tell us a little bit about your nonprofit. Um, is this something that you started? It is. It's definitely something I started. I really started as a hobby. I was a high school teacher after I graduated from North Carolina Central University. And as a high school teacher, I was coming across kids through ninth and 12th grade who um, were struggling with like independent living skills. And some of them were about to graduate and be done with school. Some of them were parents. They had kids and they didn't know how to manage their money. They didn't know how to uh, effectively communicate with other people. Um, they didn't know how to address the envelope with the return address mm. and stamp where it all went. So we would have this hobby after school where I would help kids and it would be like seven or eight kids after school. They would stay with me and I kind of um, mentored them through the things they would need to be successful after high school. And if they wanted to go to college, I made sure they understood financial aid, how to mm -hmm. apply. Um, if they wanted to get a job, I helped them understand how to create a resume nice. that would work. Um, and I was kind of like a reference point for them. I even helped some of them get the credentials they needed to wow. work after school. So I was doing that as a hobby. It's something I just enjoyed to do um, in, while being a high school teacher. And when I transitioned from teaching as a mental health specialist, I really learned the skill-based approach. And even though you typically use this for individuals with disabilities, it works for anybody. So I was able to really take a skilled approach to help people instead of um, what I was doing before as a teacher. What's, what's the, what's the um, difference? What is down. a skill-based approach? So when, when it's skill-based, instead of me kind of like talking it to mm -hmm. you, um, we break it down in a way that's curriculum-based. So for instance, um, let's say we'll say finances mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, I would get them a, a makeshift like workbook that has the curriculum of uh, managing their budget and how to manage it. And then we would have 
checks and they would see how to fill mm -hmm. it out and how to manage you pull the different checks out for different things. We had the fake little like credit card. Mm -hmm. Um, cause you know, in the mail, we get all these little fake credit cards. Yeah. So I started collecting mm -hmm. them and we would do uh, mock skills assignments where they would have this credit card and I'm like, okay, so charge the card. You're charging the card for your hairdo, you're charging your card for your clothes. And through showing them like, this is when you spend up all mm -hmm. your money, this is what you have left. What are you saving? What are you putting on the side for yourself? Um, rainy day funds and, and really breaking mm -hmm. it down in a way where I'm not just here talking to them, but they going through yeah. the motions. That's smart. Pending tax charge. And um, it was effective. It was working. And so uh, I took that idea and I started Achievable Greatness. Mm -hmm. um, we've been around for about four years mm -hmm. and it has been my labor of love. It was how I started entrepreneur, being an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't something I did that I was like born to do, like where I woke up and said, I just have to be a business owner. I came in this kicking and screaming because I didn't really want to be mm -hmm. a business owner. I just wanted to help yeah. people. Like I want to really help young people. Um, but I noticed as a hobby, I couldn't reach as many kids as mm -hmm. I wanted to. So I said, if I really focus and streamline it into a nonprofit, I can reach more young nice. people. Um, so that just meant I was going to have to learn the skills to do that. And I was dedicated to doing that. So I worked a full-time job. I was a mother to two kids. And on the side, I was making my baby wow. happen. So I was you work it. out of your home, not out of a rented space? I have a space as well. Uh, I, I actually should be there more often, but I like to be at mm -hmm. home. Well, <laughs> but we have space. And the reason for the space was um, when you're pitching for certain grants, and money, they want to see that you have a, a real yes. place. They don't they don't want PO boxes in your yeah. house. Um, so we were very clear that we wanted to be able to pitch for money that will sustain mm -hmm. us. So it was necessary to have it. Um, when I first started my company, my board of directors was my grandmother and my brother um, until I was able to get a real board of directors. Uh, like I really was like, I'm doing this. Like what has to be done? I don't care until we could make the transition, but it worked. It's kind of like when I got in front of the right people and they saw like, she's really seriously gonna do mm -hmm. this. How can I help her? It was kind of the support I got and people were nice. nice. So it's definitely been a blessing. I enjoy working with young people and I enjoy being able to see them transition from feeling like I mm -hmm. used to, where you just feel stuck yeah. and the world sucks and it's not gonna get any better to saying, oh no, I can make mm -hmm. a difference. Um, so I enjoy watching them go through that process. So have you, have so you, have um, you moved to making this full time or are you still working full time and still doing this on the side? Oh, no. So I about two years ago, I had a massive heart attack and I almost died. Oh. And during that time, I was stressed out a lot because I was working this Jeez. job and I was taking care of my kids. And, and around this time, my daughter was starting to have mm -hmm. episodes. Um, I was in school because I've been working um, to get my license to be a licensed professional counselor. Okay. Um, so my plate was just on overload. My grandmother had recently had a heart attack and had to come move and mm -hmm. live with me. Um, so I was caregiver, trying to be oh caregiver. My God. No, oh my God. With all those no. things. And, you know, uh, I have the superwoman complex where I think I'm supposed mm -hmm. to do it all. Um, and, and I learned through a heart attack and almost dying that that wasn't the answer. Um, so after my heart attack, I decided to not work full time anymore, um, quit my job and just focus on my my dream, because I really believe that God put me here for a reason. And the reason was to do that, um, to touch lives. And I really believe that um, if I trust that he will make a way, he will. Um, and I would say that, but then I would still keep my job because I was like, trust him. <laughs> But this is a steady check. Um, but it, it, I was stressed out all yeah. the time. So yeah. I, I, I decided to do it. And I took leave during that time where I was healing to get better. I really, really focused um, on how to generate money, how to monetize mm -hmm. myself. Um, I paid attention to what people were paying me to do. People were paying me to show them how to start their companies. And people were... Um, paying me to show them how to use social media to grow a following and engagement and promote their products and services. And so I said, this is a side business right mm -hmm. here. 
Um, and then I got paid to speak somewhere like professionally. And I was like, okay. <laughs> like that one. So started, <laughs> like that one. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I'm going to pull this together. And that um, has helped. So I supplement my income, um, not just a nonprofit, but being able to do coaching and consulting, which is something I just started this mm -hmm. year. And um, every once in a while, I might get a mental health client uh for someone just to help keep my feet sure. wet in the field um because i want to become a licensed counselor so our nonprofit will provide both skill-based services and mental health services under the same umbrella and um for specifically at black kids they don't get the best counselors sometimes mm -hmm. um who understand their culture understand their family dynamics um so when i was noticing the struggle i was having with my daughter fine and quality mm -hmm. therapist, I said, well, I'm going to become one so um, I can help meet that need. And so I'm almost done there. I got like a year All right. and All right. I'll be a licensed professional counselor, Lord willing, oh, you will. You will and be I'll be able to, um, to, to do that. So um, to best answer your question, no, I don't work a full-time job anymore. I'm actually um, spoiled because I like working for myself, setting my own hours, doing mm -hmm. my own thing. So when I have to do my supervision and my practicum for school, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to be working under someone. And I told her that. I said, look, I want you to know um, I'm a really good employee, but I, I haven't been one for a long time. So you got to bear with me. That's working. That's working. So, yeah, it is. So, so when you're lying in bed, so right, after, lying the in bed, right after the alarm goes off, do you mm -hmm. try to figure out you what to do to next? To or do you wake up? focused and knowing exactly what you're going to do that day. I don't do any of that stuff. When I wake up now, I meditate. Mm. So, uh, and then that's something that I started doing since I had the heart attack. So I don't spend um, any time when I first wake up worried about anything other than just meditation time alone, um, staying peace, staying calm, mm. um, starting my day off positively is important. Um, so I take that time to kind of rest, rejuvenate, get it, get myself together. And then after that, like, and, and that, sometimes I can meditate for 10 minutes mm -hmm. and sometimes I might be lucky enough to get like 45 minutes or an hour. It just yeah. depends on the day okay. um, and what time I wake up. And after I do that, then I get started. I, I look at my phone, I kind of see if I missed mm -hmm. anything important, mm -hmm. um, get my son ready for school, get him out, get his day started. Mm -hmm. And then I go in and start really thinking about it. But I don't put a lot of energy into the day so much. Um, my phone tells me if I have meetings, which helps. Mm -hmm. I'll tell Siri. I talk to her a lot now. Um, Siri, schedule my appointment at 9 a.m. So she'll give me a little notice that I have a 9 a.m. appointment. Mm -hmm. um, and it keeps me from missing stuff. But I don't really stress about it. It's pretty much, okay, I, this is what it okay. is, you know. So you've written a book, Life in Lyrics. Where the where the song titles um, tell a little bit about some aspect of your life. Now, I don't mean to. This is not. I don't mean to be morbid, but I've already told my sister, for example, when I go, if I go before you, you've got to play "Pretty World" by Sergio Mendes and Brazil '66 at the funeral, and I very proudly chose. Uh, what was that? Um, uh, Let There Be Love by Natalie Cole for my dad's funeral. And that was like the perfect mm -hmm. song. So not trying to be morbid, but in looking at your life, life and loves, what song would you like played at your funeral? I have the perfect song, but I don't think my mom or, or anybody in my family would want it to be played at my funeral. But I told you before, I love me some Tupac, right? Oh. So Keep Your Head Up would probably be the song I'd want to play. <laughs> Keep Your Head Up. Yeah. So it's okay. You know, no matter what. I don't know how they would feel about that, but like you know, that. That, would, that, would, well, that would be the song. Well, you need to write that down. Because I, I told my sister that I'm writing it down. If I don't I don't care about anything else, but you got to play Pretty World. That's, just, that's my jam. <laughs> Makes a difference. Uh, I'll have to add that. I've already given them kind of a run for their money. When I got sick, I had to prepare mm -hmm. what would happen yeah. to, you know, my kids and mm -hmm. everything. And in that, I um, told them, said that I wanted to be cremated. And that was a tough thing for them. My grandparents don't Your believe in that. Your folks don't believe in that, yeah. Yeah. But I was like, I'm dead. Like, don't spend a whole lot of money. Just 
burn me and keep it moving you know and it was kind of like that but I understand, so, I understand. I'm, I'm not gonna add the Tupac song just yet you know I'm gonna warm them up to the idea exactly <laughs> well hold up your book again so we can take a gander at it life and here lyrics. it is again life and lyrics who designed the cover that's a beautiful cover actually I had someone on Upwork develop the cover for me um for pretty cheap dude. Mm -hmm. Uh, cause I don't like to spend a lot of money. That's one thing you'll learn about me. I'm very frugal. Uh, I drive a 97 Honda Accord, love it to death. My disabled, uh, um, 1993 car is sitting in the driveway right now. Yeah. Yeah. I shop at Goodwill for okay. clothes. Um, I don't really like to spend a lot of money. The most expensive thing I think I own is a purse that my mom gave me. Okay. Um, that's Michael Kors. She I'm sure your computer costs a pretty penny. Oh yeah, well yeah, that I, I did. But the reason why I got this computer is because I bought like four HPs, and they would last no time. Like they would maybe a year, and I was like, I'm not gonna keep buying a freaking computer every year yeah. because it just stops working. Um, so I'm gonna get an Apple, and my sister had had her Apple for like five years, mm -hmm. and it was still trying. Oh, yeah. So I was like, I'm gonna get one. I'm gonna make the investment, so I don't have to buy it. But if it wasn't for that, I probably wouldn't have my apple either um because i just don't like to to spend a lot of money yes it did help oh, yeah. me. since you yeah your frugality probably allows you to quit your day job not everybody can do that i know if it was up to me we wouldn't even have cable in my house but i live with my grandmother and she need her shows and she made that very clear that you she have to accommodate your grandma I know. So we, we have it, but you know, I'm really like one of those people. Uh, I don't like to go to the grocery store and spend tons of money on food. Like I really like want to make sure that it's smart and we eat it all up before we go again. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I'm one of those people. It, it works well for my life. I think I like it, but it doesn't work for everybody. I'm very frugal as it well. Doesn't. I will make a vat of spaghetti and I will eat that every day until it's done. And in fact, when I was taking care of my aunt, I actually moved down here to take care of my aunt. She had Alzheimer's. Uh, same way. We, we, um, and the cool thing about Alzheimer's is that they always forget what they just had. So you can just keep giving them the same dinner every day. She never complained about it. So yeah, frugality is a, is a good thing. Yeah, well, I, I, it works for me. It definitely has helped me. Um, I splurged on experiences. So, um, like, for instance, I took the kids to Great Wolf Lodge, um, and that was expensive, but it was an experience. Don't remember so, that. Like, those, yeah, so those kinds of, like, trip things, I'll, I will spend money there. But, um, like, my car, I, it's not so much important to me. I want to live in a decent house in a nice neighborhood just because um, before I was trying to be frugal, and I lived in the neighborhood where um, I, my house got shot up. Oh. Um, and someone someone died, like, right in, in my carport area. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so I decided at that point to live cheap was not going to be the option anymore. I, I bought a, um, uh, I bought a former crack house when I was in Chicago. That was interesting. Uh, it, it worked well, out fine. I mean, it worked out fine. That's good. I mean, the first year, cause it was in Hampton, Virginia. Um, and when I, the first year I lived there it was okay. Like we didn't even see many of those issues. I knew at nighttime it was stuff, but we, I don't go out at night. So it really didn't bother right. me. Um, but then the next year, the crime rate just got really mm -hmm. bad. Um, and there was a lot of robbing and shooting. And that, when that um, ha the incident happened where someone got shot at the corner store and they ran to my house and they continued to shoot at them and Dang. the bullets went through my bedroom. And one of the bullets went through my bedroom where my bed was located. Wow. So if I had been sleeping there, that bullet would have hit me. Um, and so I'm talking about Shell Road. So you know exactly what I'm talking about. You probably remember when that incident took place. Wow. Um, it was very um, tra traumatizing because uh, I was having, I have kids. I was like, no, they could have got hit with a straight bullet. Um, so we moved. And, and since that time in Virginia Beach, it's been great. Mm -hmm. I live in a really nice neighborhood. I pay more to live here. It's but it's worth it. Right? And so, <laughs> so it's cool. Uh, yeah, I don't have that, that experience anymore. Um, but other than that, I, I don't spend a lot of money on other things. Um, and, and so let me ask you one last question. As I was yeah. going through your book, Life and Lyrics, hold it up because I don't have a copy. Life and Lyrics, yeah. boom. I was wondering if you would come up with a workbook version. Hmm. 
since you're using it with That's troubled cool. youth anyway. Yeah. And, and at know, risk I'm a youth, teacher. I, I think it would be really up. slick if you came out with the workbook version. It's a good idea. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to add that to my list of things to do. I mean, you did this book in what, three weeks? Well, you said you started it and then put it down. I started to stop. I really wrote it in like three days. Like, really. Well, that's what I meant. Um, yeah. 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 It, but it took like, I, I gave myself a three week mm -hmm. um, period, but I actually wrote it in three days just because when, when I, I'm one of those people where if the desire hits, the creativity comes, mm -hmm. I don't want to stop until it's done. So I kind of put life on mm -hmm. hold and I just do it and, I, and then it comes out really good. So I just do that. Mm -hmm. Um, Another thing I didn't mention, and I may mention it for the first time on your show. This is an exclusive for TV mm. Skywriter, just for you. Uh, in the last week, I was really working really hard um, because I told you one of my limiting beliefs is writing. I don't feel I'm very good in that area. Um, so I Not tackle true. my limiting head on whenever I feel that way about mm. something. So for the past week, I have been working really hard. And I generated about 12 different um, blog pitches and I pitched to the Huffington Post and Ariana Huffington sent me an email on Friday, basically saying she loved one of my articles uh -oh. and that she would like for me to be a blogger for the Huffington uh -oh. Post. I will be getting my login information on Monday and my uh, our post should be coming up um, some between Monday and Tuesday. -ish. Congratulations. Um, so Thank you. I'm super excited the about it. Post because it was writer. Like, good it was good enough for the Huffington Post that I got to be an okay I writer. I think so. Um, I told you that. But I really uh, definitely am glad that I did it because I needed that kind of like boost mm -hmm. to, to tell myself, like, stop telling yourself crazy stuff, girl. Like, what is wrong with you? You can really, you can really do this. Thank you, everyone. Um, and, and don't be so critical because I think when when I read other people's posts and I see other people's writings, I think that I need to be on their level. Mm -hmm. But no, I just need to tell my story uh, and, and keep it my story. Mm -hmm. and, and it works. And, you know, everyone writes differently. So just reminding myself um, that and, and this opportunity is a reminder. And if and so I, I'm, I'm going to cut back on the what I can't mm -hmm. do exactly. and only focus exactly. on what I can do. And, and, it's, and, I started. and it is important to do you because I work very hard at my writing and I think I'm decent, mm -hmm. but my sister is what I call a gifted writer. She can write in yeah. the style of Shakespeare. She can write mm -hmm. satirical pieces. She can, she's very creative. I just write straightforward, like a journalist, just, you know, yeah. plain and simple. Yeah. Boom. There it is. And even when I'm writing about my life, it's still very straightforward. Um, I don't consider it great writing at all, especially when I compare it to mm -hmm. how my sister, she, it just flows with my sister, but she takes it for granted and she doesn't do any writing. So I learned not to compare and just, you know. Yeah, it's, it's not a just, good idea. I just but, said, just do your you know, thing. I definitely live in a world where we are conditioned to compare, mm -hmm. you know, and compare. So, it's kind of reminding myself that I don't have to do that. It's okay. And that someone will hear my story and it will make perfect sense to mm -hmm. them. And I just need to focus on the person who will read my story and it will make perfect sense. Mm -hmm. And don't beat myself up if I go back and I see the story and I, I messed up the sentence somewhere. Because like that really bothers me. Like if I read yeah. something, well. like I went through my book and I was like, there's a typo. Oh my God. Like, But I'm like, calm down, Danielle. Typos happen and, and life goes on. So. Exactly. So that's that. So. Danielle, I really enjoy interviewing you. I love your book. Hold it up. Life and lyrics. Yeah. Boom. There you go. And tell us again where we can find it. Um, this book is located on Amazon.com where you can get you can get the actual hard copy book. You can also uh, get the um, Kindle version. You can also get the book at Barnes and Noble and you can get the Nook version as well. If you live in Hampton Roads, Virginia, you can buy the book at Positive Vibes, mm. um, a black owned bookstore in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And if you want a signed copy of the book, if you message me, mm. I will make sure that happens because some people like to have them autographed. Absolutely. So I do. 
after hearing your story, I think everybody would want an autograph book. <laughs> well, you can get one. Just reach out to me. I'll, I'll make it happen. I definitely will send it out. Okay. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to end the recorded part of the show. Then we can hang out with people who want to jump in. So I just want to thank everyone for watching TV Skywriter. Danielle Boos was my guest. I'm Patricia A. Murray. Usually you can find me at DurhamSkywriter.com. That's Durham, North Carolina's online community paper. And with that, ciao for now. Thank you.